it would end up being unsustainable to the point where my brain would be blitzed by like midday because of the yeah. speed I was expected to type and discharge, do discharge letters and then the consultant discharges, but we, you know, we do all the paperwork and manage everything and prep everything. Yeah. And the rates at which I was expected to work just made me feel brain fried, but is this sustainable? I feel like a shell of mm -hmm. myself. And I was so exhausted that I would just spend my days off in recovery. Around Christmas time as well, I was, we were dealing with more unwell patients at Christmas time as is in the general trend, you know, in England. At that point, I just, I just really did not, I didn't want to be <laughs> doing that mm -hmm. at Christmas time. And the way that it impacted me, the kind of heaviness of the topics that I was working with just felt yeah. so, far away from what all my friends and family were dealing with at Christmas time and I was just suddenly so jealous of their normalcy and, and normal life that mm -hmm. I thought am I gonna be doing this forever you know am I gonna have all Christmases like this where I go home and I think I don't actually feel like seeing my family right now because I've just been dealing with breaking bad news to other families what is going on guys my name is kenji welcome back to my channel hope this is the first time you're watching one of my videos but just in case it is i'm a doctor working in london and today i have a very very special guest on the channel who is helena helena was an nhs doctor she works in the nhs for one year before quitting for reasons we get into in this video to pursue her own dream and passion of starting her own business this is one of my favorite interviews that i've had on my channel the reason being is because loads of youtubers including myself always talk about the amazing side of medicine and how we're so passionate about it but the reality is that medicine isn't always amazing and there is a flip side to it that a lot of doctors do find very difficult to deal with on a daily basis including myself if you're someone who's thinking about going into medicine or is already in medicine then please 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 stay to the end because it's really important that you understand not just the good sides of medicine but also the more darker sides that all doctors deal with on a daily basis so this is a very deep and insightful video that we have with Helena let's go ahead and get started so Helena thank you so much for joining us do you want to just tell us a bit a bit, a bit about who you are and uh, how you got to where you are today? Yeah, thank you so much for having me, Kenji. I really appreciate it and I'm really excited to chat as well. Um, so I'm Helena. I was an NHS doctor and I trained in a London medical school, worked my F1 and throughout my F1, I decided that actually I don't want to do this and I want to change my path. Since then, I have started a coaching business. I now work one-to-one -one with clients who are in a similar position to what I was and thinking about leaving medicine and now I'm building a program for said clients who are feeling the same way that I did because I think there are way more people out there feeling that way than I could have ever imagined. Amazing yeah. I'd love to go into a bit more detail about like your program and what you do because that, that also sounds really really cool. Yeah. Um, if we could go back to uh, a couple of years ago when you were a medical student, so if we can take it back to then. Yeah. What was your time like as a medical student? If we, if we start off by maybe talking about what you enjoyed, um, what were the positives, would you say? I, I actually loved most of medical school. I think I had a pretty typical uni experience. I came straight from, what well, I went to school and then I went to college for sixth form equivalent. And then I went straight into medical school. And I think medical school culture is play hard and work hard, which I really oh, yeah. loved. And um, the studying was a great thing that I think I was so motivated to do well in medical school and that really kept me going and yeah. kept the ball rolling. And it also kind of was a place where my self-development journey started too, because I think that commitment to excellence and commitment to learning mm -hmm. throughout your lifetime, that was something that I picked up on in medical school and then I've carried all the way through to where I am now and something that I hope to continue. Mm -hmm with as well what so okay one of the reasons why i want you on here is because i feel like loads of youtubers including myself are we talk about the things we love about like medicine the things we love about the job but we don't kind of go into more detail about the other side of medicine and i think like mm -hmm. every job in the entire world there's positives about a job there's positives about a degree but there's also things that we may not necessarily like and i definitely need to do a better job of, about talking about that on my channel but what sort of things did you did you maybe not like as much then in medical school in particular? I think in medical school there is a sense of pressure that is very weighty and heavy and it's mm. in hindsight when I think about it the amount of pressure that medical students put themselves under to perform really highly is kind of insane yeah. because you're already doing something that's really really difficult yet we're all ranked mm. against each other at least in my medical school I don't know if it was the same yeah, in yeah. yours. Same as Kings yeah. Yeah we literally get a number to say how we ranked out of everyone in our year and I think that culture yeah. can be very 
stressful for people and feeling pitted against your peers who are meant to be, you know, your best friends. Mm -hmm. Yet there's still that element of comparison in the back of yeah. your mind. That I think is really difficult to deal with. And then Absolutely. I also think that for a lot of medical school students, because they are quite mm -hmm. academically, uh, what's the word? Well, they've achieved well academically so far. Um, yeah. There's that aspiration that you want to always be the best that you can be. And so if you fall mm -hmm. short or you're falling short relative to your peers, then I think that can add a lot of pressure and panic. And the control freak mm -hmm. and perfectionist who's always done so, so well, got your A stars and everything yeah. can feel really sad and almost like you're never good enough. And there's just this fear of failure that, I don't know, for me, at least really permeated yeah. my my exam time that I was always scared. I, I wanted to do the best that I could do, but I was always worried it would never be good enough. And I think that Absolutely. is just a really, that's a painful place to be in when you're already doing something that's really mm. difficult. I felt that as well, to be fair. What I found, uh, what I think a lot of medical students find hard is that, you know, getting into medical school is obviously hard and the entire process is really difficult and the, the entry requirements are so high and you're used to performing highly in school maybe because you managed to get into medical school and yeah. then you get into medical school and now you're surrounded by 500 other people who also did really well in their yeah. school years and want to continue doing doing really really well so i found that really challenging and as you said the constant like you know exam pressure and knowing where you ranked and then you finally become a doctor and that you know that still kind of carries on when you go to think about what you want to do as a specialty and again being ranked and and then you know also i guess as a doctor your ranking matters even more because it, you know it, it, it determines where you go in the country and yeah. who you're close to and that definitely de can be quite difficult i i i believe um yeah anything was there anything else in, in medical school that you found you know difficult or, or challenging at all i would say yeah it's mainly that but that kind of factors in some other yeah. stuff and i think for me, I put a lot of pressure on myself. That was kind of an unfair amount of pressure mm. to put on someone who's also quite yeah. young. I mean, retrospectively, when you think about it, you know, you're yeah, like 18 yeah. or 19 years old. And I would just mm. think, I would be so terrified of failure. Um, yeah. Even though the concept of failure in medical school would mean failing an exam, which technically mm. is not, it's not the end of the world, but it would almost feel that way because it was such a big thing and a big thing that I assigned yeah. pressure to. Um, I think apart from that, there were lots, I think there were lots of buffering factors to that, you know, having peers mm. who are going through exactly the same thing. And you can at least have that bond with them where you all feel that pressure and you're grafting, yeah. you're just trying to get to the end of it together. Um, yeah. But I think maybe one of the more unique pressures that my cohort faced through medical school was the COVID sort of oh yeah. yeah yeah covid coming in and sweeping us off of the standard mm -hmm. medical school path um and yeah. for us we had a year or so where we didn't go into our placements and it should have been one of our clinical years so for us that was yeah i had that as well yeah mm -hmm. it changed a lot of things it kind of changed the landscape of um, medicine as well because then when we did go to placements a year or so after covid initially took off we were working mm -hmm. in um Ad adapted placements and a lot of us did yeah. kind of healthcare assistant type roles in COVID ITU mm. that in mm -hmm. itself was super overwhelming and it I think it changed a lot of people's perspectives too about medicine and the kind of pressures that are on people and in the system so I think for yeah. me that was that was a really big challenge and that was quite mm. overwhelming too but it was not I, I mean that doesn't happen for everyone it probably going forwards medical students won't mm -hmm. encounter that face-to-face -face where it's quite a different yeah, environment absolutely i i think uh what, what i find really strange about medical school mm -hmm. is so as you said the the pressures are there throughout regarding like exams and like not wanting to fail and all these things but obviously your responsibility to patients is is almost zero uh, yeah. like you, you know you go into placements you learn by lunchtime you want to go home and have lunch and there's no responsibility over someone's life yeah. and then you start working as a doctor and your your fear of failure like drops uh, a lot because there's not necessarily any exams in your first year as a doctor for example but then the opposite happens where you're now your responsibility shoots up so it's kind of like an exchange of, of uh, <laughs> stresses i guess in a way yeah um and that's definitely something i found really difficult to to go into you know as, as a new doctor agree, um, yeah. on that point actually uh, side topic, but uh, how how much do you think medical school prepares you for the reality of working as a doctor? Because I ask myself that all the time, um, <laughs> and I'll give I'll give you my answer after. But what, what, what do you think? 
I don't think it does. I don't think anything could properly prepare you. I guess Yeah. if you do something like a GP assistantship, I think that was probably the closest mm. that I got because even when you go to hospital placements, you never really yeah. deal with that level of responsibility um, mm -hmm. until what you become- What is that, GP a... assistantship? Oh, um, like? I think, well, for us, we would have a GP rotation, but we would also mm -hmm. kind of function as almost like junior doctors function in the GP practice. So you would run your own clinic, then you would run it by someone okay. and come up with a plan, run it by the GP who's supervising that day. Mm. And they could mm -hmm. give you feedback and then you'd typically either call back the patient or go back in, confirm the plan with yeah. them. Um, and for me, that was like the closest thing to having responsibility that mm. when I was a medical student because I was responsible for the plan initially although yes it's being double checked and that's really good and important of course yeah um but yeah. that was the closest I think I got I don't think anything could have prepared me for hospital medicine to be honest with you <laughs> fair enough yeah. no I had that as well to be fair I had um I, well, I think I had two things that were so, somewhat similar to what you described. So I had obviously the GP placement in final year, yeah. and I agree, like that was amazing. Um, you see your own patients, and you have more like autonomy, I guess, and you have to think for yourself. Yeah. So that was probably the closest I think I got to experiencing life as a doctor. And then in in final year of medical school, we also had this like transition to F one module, where mm -hmm. uh, it's like the final module you do, and yeah, you know everyone knows you're like this TTF one student, and I guess that uh that you're more involved as part of the team in that module yeah but again you know with zero responsibility you know with no pressure um with no on calls no weekends no nights yeah um which is very different to like starting as an f1 um i guess that was the only middle ground i had but i always say on my channel like as a medical student you you know you have no responsibility and then the next day you have all this responsibility, especially mm -hmm. for me. Um, I was in my final year of medical school. I was in the same hospital that I'm on now. So I graduated medical school in June and the following month, like <laughs> three or four weeks later, I started F1. Yeah. And it was so, it was this really weird transition period where um, I always say a story, but I remember being uh, an F1 on my first day and the, this nurse coming up to me and saying, oh, there's a doctor, there's a sick, um, a sick a patient, can you go review them? And I remember being like, oh, just give me one second, I'll go, I'll go get the doctor. And like re realizing <laughs> that that doctor is now me. Yeah. Because like four weeks ago, you know, that was, I was a medical student and I had no responsibility. So it's, it's really, really weird. I, I think medical school teaches you the, the theory of, uh, of things, but the actual reality of being a doctor is, is probably something that maybe could be improved somewhere along the line of you know maybe having this transition period where you know you're you're given a bit more responsibility and a bit more you know a bit more um uh, autonomy i guess but i guess it's quite difficult with gmc and stuff like that as well yeah um okay so let's now transition on to now you being a doctor so you finished medical school you graduated this was last 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 year last last year right 2022 i think you started Oh my gosh. No, 2021, yeah. sorry. 2021. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, okay. Yeah. Yes. So let's let's uh, let's go back to Helena in 2021 in summer just starting life as a doctor. What what was it like I guess when you started and when in that kind of uh in in that kind of time did you then start th seeing things differently regarding like your career if you don't mind me asking? I was so excited to start working as a doctor. Honestly, I was I was really raring to go, I think because I, especially after working COVID ITU and all of that in my final year, I hadn't had all the normal placements that I was going to have. And I thought, okay, this is it, great. Mm -hmm. Finally, I get to go out into the world and see how it feels to actually have autonomy as doctor and responsibility. Yeah. And so I was really, really excited. Um, and also, especially to, you know, you just start adulting, I guess, you know, you want to yeah. make your living after all of those years of medical school. So I kind of started it quite excited and starry-eyed thinking about it. Um, mm -hmm. And my first rotation was actually a transplant rotation. So it's really highly specialist mm -hmm. and it's transplant surgery, surgery rotation. And um, okay. so actually when I got there, I, I often felt quite out of my depth because it is such a specialist mm -hmm. topic that yeah. even in medical school, you do cover transplant and the basics of transplant, but there was so much more detail than you know, I could have yeah. predicted or prepared for, and I was constantly learning on the job. Um, mm. And so I think initially I felt way more out of my depth than actually some of my colleagues mm. did who were doing other gen surge rotations or colorectal or gen med. 
and mm -hmm. um i was the only f1 as well on on that rotation so for me okay. there was a little element of isolation as well in that respect mm. and my out of hours were covering other parts of surgery that my colleagues normally covered so they knew the lists and then my out yeah, of hours yeah. i would go somewhere where i would cover i think it was three lists even mm. sometimes cross cover to like five lists of different surgical specialties and i wouldn't know any of them so mm. I think the overwhelm started to creep in a bit, even in my first rotation, because it was just, mm -hmm. it was highly specialist to the point where if I wanted to prescribe fluids, if someone's just had a kidney transplant, you need the renal reg to pretty much like decide what fluids they can or shouldn't have. Um, whereas, okay. you know, in a gen surge rotation, which I then did next, you have more autonomy and you can prescribe and you don't have to make sure you double check everything. But yeah. um, that rotation, I think kind of, made me feel out of my depth, the weight of responsibility and, and kind of panic around these really fragile, delicate transplants and making sure that all the drug charts were always, always immaculate yeah. because people are literally okay. getting a brand new kidney. So you can't use drugs that are gonna knock the kidney. Um, Jeez, yeah. And also they're all immunosuppressed. So they're super careful, mm. infection controls like through the roof and everything. Um, oh gosh, yeah. So. It, I think that was quite a difficult first rotation. And I remember my reg who I worked with saying, this is going to be harder than any of the other rotations you do because this is a really yeah. specialist role. But I didn't have any other points of reference. So I think even then I was a bit nervous with that mm. job. Um, and then I rotated onto a, a gen surge job, which was really, really, really busy. And I think I yeah. started to feel the burnout and overwhelm during that rotation there. Um, and that was already within the first six months. So I did the three months on the transplant job and then it was three months on the surgical job. Okay. Yeah. Um, and towards Christmas time, because our year starts in August, um, I started yeah. to really feel the pinch of it where I was just feeling pretty overwhelmed, out of my depth a lot. Sometimes I would feel like I was doing way too much for one person in a day. And I think my first day on my gen surge job, I. I was meant to finish at 5.30 or um, mm -hmm. around then. And I remember panicking because I was the only F1 on, on the ward and they were normally meant to be two. Yeah. And I couldn't get all the jobs done, but I also was trying to figure out how to do everything. And yeah, yeah. there was more stuff piling and piling and piling. And it was getting to like 6.30 and then 6.45 and seven. And I was just thinking, oh my God, how long am I going to be here? Am I going to be here forever? And the overwhelm yeah. was just kind of building and, you know, it, it kind of continued in that way where often there would be days where I was like, oh my God, how am I going to get home? How am I going to finish all of this stuff? And mm -hmm. so the overwhelm started to really pile on. And yeah. then a big element of burnout, which I, I'm, you, you met me through my YouTube video that I posted and I explained mm -hmm. that there were a lot of factors as to why I left medicine, but these were kind of like the founding reasons that I was expected to work so fast and mm. I could work faster most days, but it would end up being unsustainable to the point where my brain would be blitzed by like midday because of the yeah. speed I was expected to type and discharge, well, do discharge letters and then the consultant discharges, but we, you know, we do all the paperwork mm. and manage everything and prep everything. Yeah. Um, and the rates at which I was expected to work just made me feel brain fried by the end of the day. And I was just, mm. you know, trying to make ends meet and going through it as a kind of like a shell of a person with just like a professional mm -hmm. front. And um, I think after a few months of that, I was just like, God, I really need like time off. I really, yeah. I really, really don't. <laughs> I don't know if I want to do this forever. Is this sustainable? I feel like a shell mm -hmm. of myself. And I was so exhausted that I would just spend my days off in recovery and, yeah. um, around Christmas time as well. I was, we were dealing with more unwell patients at Christmas time as is in the general trend, you know, in England because yeah. winters are so cold and the higher rates of pneumonia and other illnesses, especially respiratory diseases. And so even though I was on a surgical job, we were seeing that. And I remember I kind of hit my rock bottom, I would call it around Christmas when mm -hmm. um, we had a patient who I was on a shift close to Christmas overnight who had died and the family had come in and I was the one breaking the bad news. And yeah. at that point, I just, 
I just really did not, I didn't want to be <laughs> doing that yeah. at Christmas time. And the way that it impacted me, the kind of heaviness of the topics that I was working with just felt yeah. so far away from what all my friends and family were dealing with at Christmas time. And I was just suddenly so jealous of their normalcy and, and normal life that mm -hmm. I thought, am I going to be doing this forever? You know, am I going to have all Christmases like this where I go home and I think I don't actually feel like seeing my family right now because I've just been dealing with breaking bad news to other families. Yeah. And shortly after Christmas, um, I tested positive for COVID. So I then couldn't go to work for a bit. But when I got that test, I thought, oh my God, I don't have to go to work, thank God. <laughs> mm. And I really, you know, that's such a bad thing to feel. Um, but I, I thought, if that's how I really feel, there's clearly something wrong here that I really, really don't want to go to work. And that is almost a relief yeah. for me to be sick in myself, which I was pretty sick with it as well, that I didn't have to mm. go. And at that point I started thinking, okay, something's got to change because I've been doing the same thing for a few months now, hoping that it will feel better and the pressure will lift, but it wasn't happening. And you know, like Einstein's definition of insanity, it's doing the same thing over and over again, expecting things to change. Expecting different results. Yeah. yeah, and it just wasn't happening for me, um, no matter how much I came to work with a better attitude or, you know, a mind to create different results in my day. And it just wasn't changing. And I just mm. thought there has to be another way for me. There has to be a different way that I can help people but feel purposeful and I didn't know what it would look like and I was terrified at that point as well of even leaving medicine because I'd never really yeah. accepted it as a possibility or reality for me either at that point. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah I can relate to you in many many ways and that's why I wanted you on the channel. Yeah. Um, I guess I was quite lucky I guess because I started on pediatrics right which again yeah. is also super specialized these are children we're dealing with but I think what I was, why I was lucky and, um, you know, it sounds like you had a, a lot more of a difficult time is because in pediatrics, at least, um, at least uh, there is not much responsibility. I think the registrars that I was working with mm. took on that responsibility for me. So I was lucky in that it was super specialized and I could learn like maybe how the computers work and how the systems work. And I, but I didn't, I didn't have that weight on my shoulder, which sounds like, you know, is what you had. And I also didn't have any on calls or any weekend work, anything like that. So that's, that sounds really, really difficult. And then, I guess that was a it was a good thing because I, I started off the first four months being like, oh, being a doctor is actually super easy. Is this what life is like for me? <laughs> like, you know, the registrars yeah. take all the responsibility and I do nothing. But then, but then I started my uh, job in stroke medicine, stroke geriatrics, which is what, what I'm on now. And then I had, you know, four months of not much responsibility. And then, you know, starting stroke, uh, stroke with on calls. I think I had an on call like on my first week and having no responsibility and feeling like a medical student again to having all the responsibility on my, you know, stroke rotation. Yeah. Um, and then having to do like ward rounds on my own sometimes. And, you know, I had, I mean, don't get me wrong, like it sounds still better than what you had because, you know, it sounds like you had a really difficult time. But again, I, I understand what you mean by those those points in time where you you have loads on your plate, you know, understaffing being an issue and, and, and it being a lot to, to, to bear with. Mm. So, um, yeah, I really, really, really relate to what you said. Um, okay, so I guess burnout seems to be like a big theme as well, like on the news with, with junior doctors and stuff like that. Mm. Um, and you mentioned a few things um, that led to the burnout. So, you know, having not not um, well, having loads of responsibility uh, is one thing. Um, also, um, you know, being in a super specialized area, feeling like you had to do more work than you're capable of doing, you know, as a single person when maybe there should be two or three or four yeah. or five people doing that same job. Um, and again, like the emotional aspect of being a doctor, which is having to deal with, you know, mm. deliver bad news, having to see all these, you know, sick people sometimes, you know, which you're trying to help. But again, that takes a toll on you as, as, a, as a human being. And then again, you know, having to you know, expect it to, to go to, uh, to, to see your family the next day and then be super happy when you've just faced all of these difficult things. That, that's, that's definitely, you know, understandable. Mm. Was there anything else that, that led to you feeling that way or feeling, you know, burnt out or anything else at all? Yeah, I would say the rotor for sure is a huge reason. Mm -hmm. I think for most doctors, actually, the rotor is one of the harshest factors of the job. For me, I was I did mm -hmm. night shifts the whole year. Um, some rotations don't have night shifts, but for us, we worked. Yeah. I would say I didn't have that many weekends. I probably had one in three or one in four weekends off. And I also okay. worked a lot of late shifts as well. Um, mm -hmm. And I think the rotor pushed me 
really kind of to my wits end at some points and i know that okay. i think the legal limit for amount that the number of hours you can work in a week is about 72 um okay and i think i was working just shy of 72 some weeks and there would be times i would do a monday to sunday set with yeah. um i think it would be three or four of the days being long days so that's nine till ten yeah. pms and I just, by the end of it, you just like, you wouldn't know how mm. to reason. You'd be a bit delirious. You'd just be exhausted. And you'd be sitting there like really? checking your phone because you think, God, when is this shift going to end? And how much more can possibly happen today? Because, you know, I I'm not in my best mental capacity right now. I think like on one of those weeks, I was working with my registrars and it, there kind of came a point on the Saturday night, I think we'd worked he'd worked as well like six days in a row and some of those have been long days um because also when you go home after a long day it's about you know half 10 11 so by the time yeah, you actually yeah. sleep it's pretty late and the sleep you're getting isn't optimal because you're stressed because you're on a long week mm. so both of us were just like we really hope nothing dire happens now because we just weren't in like the perfect mindset to to deal with stressful situations and it just comes to a point where you're yeah. thinking i don't want difficult cases to crop up right now because I'm not feeling I can handle it optimally and I think when you get yeah. to that point as well you're like I really want to do my job and I really want to do it well but you know that you're being limited by your own exhaustion by like the cognitive tiredness you're getting um mm -hmm. and so and then when you go home you can't really recover fully until the week is over and even then you're going to be feeling almost hung over the next week because you've just yeah. been worked so hard and all the stuff that you normally use to buffer that, like eating really well, doing exercise, mm. you know, doing things that you enjoy, all of those you can't do because of the rotor as well. Mm -hmm. So you can't, yeah. you can't work less because you have to meet your rotor requirements and you can't even it out with the stuff that you normally would like sleeping in for, you know, a bit longer or yeah. doing exercise to like, increase your energy levels and eating mm. really well and cooking home cooked meals because unless you're like a superhuman it's really really hard to do all of those things in a week and for me I think that definitely led to burnout in a big way because I love having yeah the, the other parts of my life that bring me up and I just couldn't have all yeah. of that at the same time yeah the road to something like honestly as well for me I really struggle with sometimes because so take this week for example so this week i'm working uh so i was on i was on call yesterday so i was on call on monday yeah uh which is 9 a.m till 12 to till 9 30 so 12 and a half hours on that shift yeah. um and then tuesday wednesday thursday uh i'm working a normal shift so nine to five and then on the weekend so i have friday off and then on the weekend i'm working i'm on call again so i'm working nine to five uh saturday sunday and then i get the monday off but even though i do get two days off i get a friday off and i get the monday off yeah that's that's not really enough because no, you need you need like 48 hours completely of doing nothing work work related and recovering to to then um to then be okay to go back to work and some of my friends as well i thank god i, I haven't had this yet but some of my friends who are f2s have had monday to sunday and then they get the, the two days off on the monday and tuesday so they mm -hmm. work seven days straight but then two days off but like human beings aren't like math problems. It's not give one and take one. It's yeah, not like, we, we, you know, we can give you two days at the end of the week on your Saturday, Sunday, but don't worry, we'll give you the two days back. It doesn't work that way. If you've yeah. worked seven days straight and three of those days are 12 and a half hour shifts, giving us two days back on Monday, and Tuesday is not going to be enough. We're going to need more time off because we've done seven days straight. So it's exactly. not a simple like Excel spreadsheet where we can take two and give you two and you know, you'll be happy or or give you one day off on a Friday and give you one day off on a Monday. And that should somehow be your weekend, you know, when like it doesn't work like that. And that's something yeah. I find really difficult. On top of that, um, even trying to get time off for annual leave can sometimes be really troublesome. Mm -hmm. And I never really realized that was a thing, but because uh, in pediatrics, um, you know, I was supernumerary. I wasn't really like a, you know, I wasn't, um, uh, I guess, uh, a, a, a like permanent role in the rotor, I guess you can say, because I was supernumerary. When I started uh, my general medicine and being on the medical rotor, even getting time off like was so difficult. I remember one time this year, I it was my girlfriend's um, uh, graduation, and that was like a really big day that I was looking forward to. And I, I gave like seven or eight weeks notice to get this one day off. I wasn't going like to the Bahamas for two weeks. I wanted one day off, yeah. And I wasn't on call. Um, 
but because there wasn't enough staff, it became this whole issue and I had to really, you know, fight for that one day off just to, to be there for my girlfriend to see her graduate walk across the street, across the stage. So, you know, and even, even if it's such a life-changing event like that, let alone just wanting time off to just relax and do nothing at home. Yeah. That, you know, that's something that needs to be fixed. And I think that's, that's, uh, that can be really, really difficult to life as a doctor. I've seen exactly the same kind of things where I worked, where people put in their requests for their wedding, you know? We had one, I hope they don't mind me saying, one of my colleagues yeah. requested annual leave for their wedding mm -hmm. before we even started F1. So he sent into yeah. the deanery, this is the day that I'm going to be getting married. Please, could you make sure mm -hmm. I'm rated appropriately? And yeah. just went completely ignored. And they were rostered mm -hmm. to work on the day of their wedding when they'd given, oh you know, like a year's notice. And um, then and the rotor coordinator basically said, you're going to have to swap it somehow. And mm -hmm. it was just really difficult. We were trying to swap it for so long and none of us had leave or, uh, well not mm -hmm. leave, an appropriate day that we could swap and then they could take the leave yeah. on such day. But, you know, we'd all be on nights and we all, and, and it is, because the rotor's so tight, they don't really write the rotor as if, some of us are going to take our annual leave, you know? Yeah, yeah. They write the rotor as if no one takes annual leave. So that means that when you do request mm. it, often they'll, they'll say, oh, no, no, sorry, because if you do, then we're going to be down, we're going to yeah. be short. And to me, that's kind of crazy because then it means that you, the actual days that you can take your annual leave are so narrow and so few mm. that it's really difficult. You can't just take off, you know, say you want to take a holiday and you say, I want these five days mm. off. You could be rotated to work a late shift in the middle of the five days and that means you're not allowed to take it off or at least that was for us yeah is it the same for you yeah same thing yeah people couldn't get off time for their own wedding and i think i had a colleague who put in a, a wedding absence request and so did their friends and the person whose wedding it was didn't get their leave approved mm -hmm. but the friends did yeah. <laughs> and they said oh that was God. the limit for the for the well basically for the department and they were like, yeah. they're trying to get leave for my wedding. Um, so yeah, mm. that was a separate, but yeah. That, that's, that's the, yeah, <laughs> I think that's that's such a weird thing because that's exactly what happened to me, like I said. Um, just because there wasn't enough doctors on the ward that day, mm. I couldn't take time off, even though I was like, you know, it's, it's my girlfriend's graduation, it's super important to me. If there's not enough doctors, then you just can't take any leave off. And as you said, um, the system doesn't account for doctors wanting to take time off. The system doesn't account for people wanting to to um, just, just being sick, you know, just being sick yeah. at home. You physically can't come in. And unfortunately, if uh, someone's off sick or for whatever reason, that workload is passed on to the rest of the team and and they just have to kind of get on with it. And you, it, that, that that's something I find really difficult because as you said in your video, you kind of feel bad sometimes, you know, if you want to take annual leave off or you're sick and you know the ward's going to be understaffed and you know there's, there's you know, a winter pressure because, you know, there's, there's, there's COVID or whatever it might be and you feel really bad that you can't take time off because of that reason. Um, so that's, that's something that I think really struggle with yeah. as well. Um, bit of a side question again, what, what do you think about some people who might say, you know, you, knew, you chose to do medicine, I, I get this question sometimes a lot in like the comment section of my TikTok videos. <laughs> yeah, what do you what do you say to people who say, you know, you signed off for it, you should have known, um, you know, um, being a doctor is nothing new. We knew about other things that there are, there are problems like the pay and all of these things. What what do you what's your kind of response to that? I find those I find those kind of comments so funny because I've had some like that on my YouTube video and also on my tiktok as i haven't even posted much on tiktok yeah people yeah. flock to come and you know tell you that <laughs> and i always think of the saying that's um never tell someone how to tie their laces unless you've walked in their shoes and i guarantee you that most oh, yeah. of those people have not done this job or not been an f1 yeah because if they had they wouldn't say mm. that and i also think that the job is is different from what it was 10 years ago when I was choosing yeah. to go into the profession. I went to do volunteering in the hospital when I was 14, 15, 16. I was doing, yeah. I was getting experience and I was working with juniors. And I would say that mm. the stress levels that I saw them under at that time was not equal to what I started to see when I was a third year med student, a fourth year med student. And then in COVID, it changed a lot as well. And then yeah. it becomes you and you, suddenly you're the junior and it feels 
very different from what you saw before. So I would say that the landscape is probably mm. changing, but also what you, you know, you don't have the level of information that you would have until you do it. Like there's no way that you could know exactly what it is to not get your annual leave requests mm. like approved and to That's be true. sitting there at 3 a.m. with your bleep going off and, you know, attending cardiac arrests and things. You don't know how that feels until you're doing it. And when you are, you just yeah. have so much more information. Um, so I would say for people, for people who like leave comments like that, like you knew what you were getting yourself into. I think you definitely do to a degree, yeah. but you never have the full amount of information until you're doing that job and you're walking in those shoes. That's yeah, that's such a good answer because when like for, for me personally, when I chose to do to like go into medicine to pursue medicine, I was 16 years old. Yeah, and we all do that in the UK. Like in every single profession in the UK, you choose your A levels at 16. You start getting work experience in your you know in your 15, 16. And then, you know, you, you get into medical school and you have a bit more of an idea of what a doctor does. But again, you don't have that responsibility. You're not the one giving chest compressions uh, yeah. in a cardiac arrest situation. It's the doctor you'll be in a couple of years who's doing the chest compressions. And then you finally become a doctor and there's still nuances to the job that you don't necessarily understand until you're a doctor. Mm -hmm. And it would, medical school is so busy and, you know, you're in lectures and you're on placement. It, it would be impossible in some ways for them to replicate all these nuances of being a doctor and everything else the job involves. Because again, you know, you're not, when you're a medical student, you're not the one who's, you can be involved in cardiac arrest, but you're not the one who's on call all the time is responding to these, all these METs, you know, medical emergency uh, calls. And ha again, like you said, having to try book annual leave off and, and trying to get some rest uh, from the long shifts you've had. So that, that's such a good point. Um, okay, so that's, I guess, the, what you went through in 2021 mm. and then um, you went through you know, a whole entire year of working in the NHS. Um, so when did you then have a transition to what you're doing now? And if you could tell us a bit more about what you're, you're doing now, uh, that'd be great. Yeah. So I told you about how I felt at Christmas time and how I was just at kind of rock bottom and I was thinking, oh my God, am I going to do this forever? And I, yeah. I've also said in my, in my video about how a big factor for me was seeing my seniors and how their lifestyle was and how sad they were. So unfortunately, a lot of them were mm -hmm. quite sad and struggling with it as well. And I mean, like the middle yeah. grades especially. And I just thought, mm, I don't know if I wanna do this forever because I'll be in their shoes in two mm -hmm. or three years time. And the thought of that didn't fill me with joy <laughs> at all. Um, yeah. So mm -hmm. for me, a big step then was I reached out online to people who'd made YouTube videos mm -hmm. about leaving. And I said, how did okay. you guys decide? Because I, I'm not sure what to do, but I'm really thinking about it now. And um, I got redirected to a coaching website for doctors. And I ended up going okay. on this website. Um, it's called The Joyful Doctor, in case anyone was interested. Uh, <laughs> which, mm -hmm. I'll check it out. yeah, and I found um, a life coach there called Emily, who had left the NHS after her F1. And that was years ago now, but, um, reading sort of her background and having a call with her I felt actually really mm -hmm. validated seen and heard and I mm -hmm. came to coaching with this perspective that I just need to figure out what to do and I really need some clarity here and having that relationship with her it showed me a lot of things about myself and helped me define what okay. I actually care about and what I want and it became really obvious that I was just suppressing what I wanted because I was scared to want anything different yeah. from where I was and to admit to myself that this wasn't working and mm -hmm. the whole sunk cost fallacy as well you know the amount of time energy and all the hours that you spent revising for exams in med school yeah. the concept of metaphorically flushing it down the drain because I don't believe that you like lose all of that and a lot of the things that you learn, mm. discipline, things about human condition and the, the communication skills and all the stuff that you glean from medicine, like you carry it with you yeah. forever. But it was the sort of Jeez. metaphorical concept of flushing down the loo, everything that you work so hard for um, and letting go of all of that I managed to do through coaching and I loved it. And also because I loved self-development, I was really into it. Yeah. And um, through that, I kind of got clarity and I thought, um, I really want to work in the self-development industry. I've always cared about it. It's what I reach for my days off. Mm -hmm. I am such a podcast aficionado for you know, self-development. And I have notebooks and notebooks of just self-development 
things that I'd written, taken notes on and, and all this stuff. And then I was working with a coach who could reflect that back to me. And I just, it felt like a very natural decision where I thought, yeah. this is something that I love so much that it could definitely work for me. And it wouldn't feel like work yeah. either. So I started talking to my friends about it and I said, you know, guys, I, I think I might want to, I'm going to, I'm probably going to leave bed and I think I'd like to become a coach because I've been working with a coach and it's the most amazing relationship and it's mm -hmm. a supportive environment and you work on your mindset, you go to town on your subconscious and what you think is possible for you in your lifetime and all this kind of stuff that I find fascinating. Yeah. Um, and it kind of went hand in hand with my neuroscience degree as well. I did the intercalated neuroscience degree mm -hmm. and that was like where my self-development journey started. So it all kind of came together and it started to get clearer and clearer and clearer. And so I think yeah. I handed in my resignation around April. So I'd had two or three mm -hmm. months of coaching by that point. And um, towards the end of the year, I started working with people who I told that I was leaving medicine and they'd ask me, mm -hmm. what's coaching like? Um, do you want to coach me? I'm so interested, I'm so curious. And I said, yeah. of course, like, you know, let's do it. And so I set up um, <laughs> a page, like a Calendly booking page, and I started okay. coaching before I even left. And that was really difficult because I only had a really small amount of free time to do it. But um, yeah. I'd started and I was like, this is fun. <laughs> so okay. when I had time off, I was reading, learning, putting together what I'd learned in my coaching journey in order to package it in a way that I could then present it to other people and help other people through that period because once I started talking about leaving so many people stepped forwards and said yeah I've been thinking mm -hmm. about that too or I kind of wanted to leave but I've never had the balls to do it or I think I need to line something up and so I end up having these conversations with so many colleagues and even colleagues who I would never have thought would Say I want to leave medicine people just started coming out of the yeah. woodworks and talking about it with me and I just thought wow this is like there's obviously something here that I'm able to help people because I went through my decision and I went through all of that hesitancy and trepidation and the fear which is a huge factor yeah. I think for leaving and now that's what I do <laughs> so that's what I do pretty much full time so yeah wow that's how it's done. If someone wants to, you know, if they're kind of resonating with things that you said and they're also thinking about leaving medicine, where can they like find you? Where can they connect with you and join what, you know, your coaching program? Um, well, you can connect with me via my website. So I, I'm Helena Bridge, H-E-L-E-N-A-B-R-I-D-G-E. Hel up, up on the screen. Somewhere. Yeah, Helena Bridge. Um, and I have my website, helenabridge.com. And there you can read about coaching if you don't know that much about it and you're curious. I also have my booking page. So if you wanted to book in and have a free 30 minute consult, I offer that to prospective clients. And I've actually Amazing. now, since putting up my YouTube video, I have met so many of you guys. And it's actually, it feels like soul brothers and sisters because you come to the call yeah. and it's like hearing a younger version of myself or other version of myself from a while ago. Mm. And I just see so much of myself in a lot of people who I speak to. And it's just nice to yeah. have that relationship where I can say, don't worry, it's gonna be better, it's gonna be fine. And there are ways for you to push through this fear, this anxiety, mm -hmm. this difficult stage. And I've done it and I can yeah. show you, it's not, it's gonna be fine. So yeah, it's, it's such a nice process. And I think a coaching relationship can be really special and really supportive. Mm -hmm. And it's a protected environment where you can get to know yourself as well. Yeah, absolutely. And yeah, I highly recommend everyone go check that out. It's it's uh, um, I attended your workshop, the live workshop yeah, you yeah. had, and I watched the recording and uh, yeah, I, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, very, very insightful. I'm also into like self development as well. Yeah. Uh, I'm not thinking of uh, leaving medicine at this point, but I, I still it still helped me deal with the sort of um, issues that I find on a day to day basis, like we talked about. So even if you're, you're someone who's not wanting to leave medicine, I think regardless of whether you want to leave medicine or not, it can either it can also help you reinforce the decision to stay in medicine or at least deal with, you know, what you might be finding difficult on a day to day basis as a doctor. Mm. Um, before we leave, I have uh, one quick question to ask you. Um, you don't have to answer it, by the way, but it, it just came off my mind. I th I'd love to hear your opinion. This is this is kind of like the three thirty 30 minute, you know, session that I guess I guess <laughs> with on. you for your coaching. Um, but okay, this is another question that I, I ask uh, some people, um, some colleagues as well, and I think about myself. 
Is it the system that you find difficult or is it the job of being a doctor? If you had, let's say, a, a system where we didn't have these problems like we discussed mm. with the rotor and maybe you had you had um, more support and you, um, you know, you, you weren't doing the job with three people and the system was ideal as you, you know, as ideal as you'd want it to be. Yeah. Do you think you'd still leave, still leave medicine or, yeah, so is it the system or is it the job basically? That's what I want to know. I think if the system had been better, I wouldn't have left because I wouldn't have had like as much of a push. But as with anything, there's push and pull factors, yeah. but the human brain is wired to move away from pain more than it is to pleasure, as in move away from pain, protection mm. mechanism. Moving towards pleasure, it's a choice, a conscious choice pretty much. So if you have that high level of stress, anxiety, nervous system dysregulation assigned to your job and something that you're showing up for every day, it becomes actively painful for you to get up and go to work and you wake up to resistance. Yeah. If I hadn't had that, I wouldn't, even though the thought of having my own coaching business and pursuing self-development as a career choice would have been a romantic ideal and quite quite mm -hmm. a fantasy to be honest because it was it was pretty much a fantasy and now I'm living it and it's kind of amazing but yeah I don't think I would have been pushed to that point where I then was ready to invest yeah. into my own coaching journey and things because you do that when you get to the point where you're like I can't do this you know mm. so I do think if the system improved um, and the working conditions weren't so harsh I would have stayed mm -hmm. that's okay. yeah I don't know I, it, it's hard to say you know but I do think that it's yeah. the system to be honest with you I think that a lot of doctors could tolerate the difficulties of breaking bad news and the concepts of things mm. going wrong because medicine the crux of it is stuff goes wrong like that's that's the whole point yeah. you know that's the job yeah and it's not that that's difficult to handle i think it is the system the the rotor the stress the burnout and the expectations for how you should be able to work that pushes people to the edge um yeah so i yeah i think for me if the system hadn't been so bad i would have probably stayed Okay, that's that's really interesting. And when I saw your video, I was dying to ask you that question. So I'm so glad I got to ask that question. Um, so maybe I don't know. I guess maybe in a in a different universe, maybe you would have got into coaching eventually. Um, but mm. maybe it would have been a, a point where maybe you do medicine on the side, maybe part time, and yeah. and you know medicine's going great. Then maybe one day or two days a week you're doing the coaching thing, and you're balancing both. And then maybe one day um, you know you either go fall into medicine or fall into coaching, who, know, who knows? Yeah, I think if I had stayed, um, the idea for how I wanted to work and how I do kind of work now is that I wanted to do clinics, um, whether or not mm. that was going to be as a general practitioner or I was considering mm. dermatology as well. At some points I really, really liked derm. And mm -hmm. I always knew that I liked to sit down with people and talk and get to know them and do my best yeah. by them. So hospital medicine for me was definitely not not the ideal. And I think the fact that I would have to have done that for so long, for so many years, that was a big mm -hmm. factor as well mm -hmm. that I just thought, oh God, that's just not gonna make me happy. And now I do get to sit down with people, work constructively yeah. with them, really get to know them and basically like go to town on what do they want and how can we make things great for them in their life. So yeah. I do still feel very fulfilled by what I'm doing. It's just in a very different capacity now. Yeah. Absolutely. Wow. Amazing. I think that's a, a lovely note to, film <laughs> on, uh, to, to end on. Um, so yeah, Helena, thank you so much for coming on the channel. Uh, I'll leave links to everything you mentioned down below in the description and like on the screen as well um, for everyone to go check out if they'd like to. Um, it's been such an amazing conversation. So thank you so much. And thank you guys for watching as well. Yeah. Thank you so much for having me, Kenji. It was really great speaking with you. No worries at all. Yeah. Um, so yeah, thank you guys so much for watching and I'll see you on the next one.